There's a lot of noise. A lot of people are real worried. How is this election going to impact my money? There's the idea that depending on who wins, different things are going to happen. What if the Republicans win? What if the Democrats win? Should I be doing something with my money different right now? Run your home and your dough like a biblical boss. What's on your mind, Mark? What's going on? I, I think one of the joys of my life these days oh. in the summertime is a, an early morning sunrise round of golf when my daughter joins me. Right. And uh, we did that this morning. So we were out of bed real early and Uncle Uncle Joe bailed on us. So we ended up getting paired up with a random twosome and uh, two two guys. Um, one thing that happened to us was amazing. A, a small wild red fox came and just wanted to be, wanted to be with us for multiple holes. I like that. Like a little puppy. It stayed, stayed with the, with the, the golf cart and just, I don't know. I don't know if people have been feeding this fox, but that was pretty cool. I have some photos of that. Um, but it it got me thinking this random pairing we had with these two adults males um how strangely you're describing these fellows go ahead i feel like i need to say something cuz our audience is mostly adult males yeah and as the round went on we got to know a little bit about these two guys they were family men they were married they were they were friendly um nothing bad to say about these guys except i feel like there was a time maybe 20 years ago and certainly 40 years ago this is a given right. when a man even if he was a potty mouthed sailor would moderate his cursing in the presence of a woman certainly in the presence of a young woman girl yeah these chuckleheads couldn't oh. form a sentence without four f-bombs and uh it was so ingrained in them that right. I, I just wanted to say like consider not swearing guys because it makes you sound like a poor idiot um yeah. and i don't know if we've ever said that but there it is i i think i went through this phase i don't know when i'm in the in the early 2000s where the church people were like, we can say a cuss word and it'll help us be relatable. And now I'm just kind of like, it helped you sound like trash. And so uh, I don't know. I, I I don't think we've ever covered this. We could probably do a whole episode and, and I would like to do a whole episode at some point on what it means to be a gentleman. But um, I know that's not today's topic. I just thought, Man, bring back some chivalry. Open the door for a woman that you don't know, even if it makes her mad because she's a feminist. Take some secret delight in that. Don't use trash language around a lady. Um, stand up when people enter the room. Stuff like that. I I'm just going to say it because it, it really, there was a bee in my bonnet this morning uh, on this topic. Yeah, I think that's fair. So, I mean, my question is, did you ever correct these, these men? I, I asked them to tone it down, and they were like, oh, gosh, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. And then three seconds later, it was such a pattern of their lives that they couldn't. They, it was like asking them to speak Spanish for the rest of the round. Uh, so, um, like I said, they weren't, they were not uh, trying to be a uh, jerk or anything like that. And that almost made it sadder to me that, like, this is who these guys are. And they have no ability to turn it off. So I wasn't, we were having a delightful morning and I was like talking to my daughter. I said, I'm just not going to make this a thing where we're now, we're, we're enemies with these two people we have to spend the next two hours with. Yeah. But we talked about it afterwards and we talked about that. Let's find husbands that uh, know how to be gentlemen and, and can kind of preserve some decorum around the ladies. You know, it's not, I got to say, it's not just, uh, it's not just, please don't use these six magical words. The much bigger topic uh, that has to do with discipleship and growing up into a mature man that the Bible talks about is, can you keep control over your tongue? 
period. So these guys let you know in a really short amount of time, they cannot do that. They cannot, right. they cannot control which words they say and don't say. And if you can't control your tongue, the odds that you're going to control other appendages once you're in a marriage seem to be pretty low. So X that guy off the list of husband candidates. What else? The, the topic today is the news today, and it's the, it, we're taking a break from our protection series. We have a lot. As we want to do, we set up this series we're very excited about. We can't wait to give you five in a row on this subject. Oh, wait, there's something that we need to talk about. Yeah, and so um, there's a few people that listen to this podcast that are our clients over on the business uh, side, Outpost Advisors. I just sent out an email yesterday to all of our clients that talks about really the same thing we're going to talk about on the podcast today, because this is one of the number one things I'm getting questions about at the moment. And that is, hey, Mark, somebody took a took a shot at the former president last week. I heard uh, about that. There's the Republican convention. We don't know who the president, the current president is going to be in three days. Uh, or who's going to run against Donald Trump for the next presidency. Well, what the heck am I supposed to make of all this politics stuff? And specifically, is this going to affect my money? Am, uh, should I be placing bets or should maybe we could even tie it into the protection episode? Do I need to do something to make sure my money doesn't all get, you know, washed away in whatever uh, flurry of financial market activity is going to happen because of these elections? Like, how do I deal with the financial ramifications of big presidential election years? And yes. I thought it would be a service to you, listener, if we talked about that topic today on the podcast. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, set up for, for uh, to put it up on the tee for you to knock it into kingdom come. Uh, the, what I think is the man on the streets attitude about elections in general. I think that in most people's minds, we're looking at our two options here in America. We really basically get two options when it comes to choosing the leader of the land every four years. And uh, as close as you and I might think that they are to each other, the man on the street thinks these two options are so radically opposed to one another. Well, they are in some, they are in some ways. Um, but when it comes to the, our little world of finance, people think, well, if the R's win, we're going to go back to fiscal responsibility. And that might be r right or wrong. You and I probably have data points that would, that would could support either idea, but that's the idea. If the R's win, fiscal responsibility, the economy will be stronger. If the D's win, we will continue down this high inflation route, high uh, housing costs, uh, trouble at the gas pump, et cetera. And so people think which administration wins has such a massive effect on the economy and what markets will do that I've got to kind of I got to keep my hand on the on the buzzer while I'm watching the wh what's happening with the election, and then I can smash it based on who I think is going to win. So, Mark, tell me what do I do based on which party it looks will win, and how do I play this game right? And would you say that summarizes what most people think? Yes, absolutely. Okay. What do you say? What do you say to these people? Um. Well, I, I want to just take a step back because, you know, I, I, well, I think part of the reason I'm getting all these questions right now is because people go, you know, it's been bad in the past. There's been uncertainty. But right now, our nation is at the crossroads. Like, this is the election that will determine everything. Um, it's so important that we get it right. And... Um, so I, I kind of want to, to give you some, some data to help you maybe figure out, is that true? I, I've never heard that line before, except for like four years ago. <laughs> and then well, four years before that. Are you aware of the fine folks at Gallup? The pollsters? The Mark? pollsters, yeah. Not Gallup like a horse. It's Gallup. I think it's pronounced Gallup, though. Um, 
but they they pull Americans and they ask things like, what are your top concerns uh, right now in the realm of economic issues? And the top three amongst Americans right now are number one, I this is whoever answered this, I want to hit them upside the head. But geez, you hate the people that respond to polls, the economy in general. I just I'm worried about the economy in general. OK, whatever that means. Number two, inflation. OK, I'll give you that one. You, you inflation has been high. Um, yeah. Number three. And this one is near and dear to my heart because it's the one that I'm worried about. But the federal budget deficit, mm. a.k.a. we are spending way more than we're making. Anybody who's listened to this podcast knows that if that's your family's situation, you're you're. Uh, headed for a bad scene. So yes. that's our country's situation. So what about non-economic issues? Well, here's the top three things Americans are concerned about. These are not Republicans or Democrats or whatever. It's broadly across the country. Okay. Number one, poor leadership in the government. That's the number one non-economic concern. Okay. Number two, unity. U- unity amongst Americans. We're we're just bifurcated. We're, we're at each other's throats, the right and the left. True. Number three, I don't know what this means because I keep hearing it get thrown around, but democracy. People say, what's your top concern? I'm concerned about democracy. Oh, boy. Um, whatever that means. I think what it means is we're, we're concerned that if the next election, depending on which side you're on, I think it's going to get thrown and, and the... The results won't be right. Or I think somebody's going to lose and refuse to step down or whatever. Um, democracy. Okay. Now, I did a little homework and I said, are these problems new? I, I'm a big student of the word of God. And it actually has something to say. In Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says, mm. there is nothing new under the sun. The full verse says, what, it, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. You've heard that verse if you've ever listened to the Beatles. Um, but I think that the, the, the truth is very, very relevant to the situation. And when I did a little homework, I found that that truth can be discovered in things that, that we've heard from important people in America in the past. So if you're thinking, man, these, these issues, they're, they're new on the scene in America. Let me read you some quotes. The U.S. Central Bank is one of the most deadly hostilities existing against the principles of our Constitution. Who do you think said it, Steve? Gavin Newsom. I would have thought maybe Milton Friedman or one of these economist guys. No, it was Thomas Jefferson. Um, inflation is a gradual tax upon the people. Who do you think has been really against inflation and thought that was the, the big issue of the day that needed to be addressed? Ron DeSantis. It was Ben Franklin. Um, you know, Ben Franklin, uh, not, uh, not super recent in the political history of our country. President Ben Franklin? Um, he actually didn't, didn't become the president, but I do love how three year letterman on, uh, Twitter always posts pictures of president Ben Franklin. And every time people argue with him. Yes. Um, public debt is a public curse. That was James Madison. I know who didn't say that Donald Trump. Am I right? Yeah, he will get into that. But, uh, here's one. This sounds like today. The distemper of our nation is certainly incurable. That was George Washington. <laughs> so from day wow. one, we have a bad temperament. And uh, John Adams, the last founding father I'm going to quote, said, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. Wow. So we might feel like all these problems, you know, we're at this fever pitch right now, big problems. But the truth is, we have been talking about the exact same six problems, really, since the founding of our country. So I'm, I'm not saying that to say these aren't problems and we shouldn't have real conversations about solving them. But don't let somebody tell you, hey, this is a uniquely horrible time and we need a leader like my favorite politician to solve these problems because they've never been things we faced before. That's just not true. Okay, as much as I said the problems aren't new, they are real. 
and we have two parties and they have different ideas how to solve those problems. So, um, you know, what I think is driving a lot of the fear and the money concerns around, well, should I be doing something with my money different right now? It's because people go, what if the Republicans win? Well, that might that might be really good for certain things. Um, and I, I looked up, you know, kind of some analyst opinions about this. They said, well, if Republicans win, you know, financials and bank stocks, those are going to do better because they, they might lower regulations and lower capital requirements on banks. And aerospace and defense companies might thrive because the Republicans tend to like them a good war. Um, you know, healthcare. Healthcare might do well because there's there's this idea that you should have private businesses uh, competing in that space instead of nationalizing things. Uh, oil and gas tends to do better under Republican uh, administrations because there's more support for domestic drilling and things like that. Um, well, what if the what if the blue team wins? What if the Democrats win? Well, uh, telecommunications, believe it or not they're in line to maybe do a little better because there's a, there's more government funding of infrastructure and broadband and things like that. Tech manufacturing historically done better. I'm curious if that stays the case given that Elon just is kind of leading an exodus from kind of the blue states into places that are more business friendly, but renewable energy, you've heard a lot of the green, the green energy and the, the green new deal, that type of stuff. So, there's there's the idea, whether it's true or not, that uh, depending on who wins, different things are going to happen. And you might think, well, I've heard that, you know, my team is better for the stock market. So maybe I should just sit out and see who wins and then invest. But I'm going to give you a little stat. The the average stock market return in election years since 1928. Now, I'll remind you, the Great Depression happened shortly thereafter. So we're including Black Tuesday and the worst period of stock returns ever in our country's history. So all the way back to before that, in election years, since 1928, the average stock return is 11.5%. Um, wow. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Um, so the stock market tends to do well in election years. And all but four of the past 28 presidential election years have seen positive stock market returns. Um, now, you might go, OK, I hear you. You're saying presidential election years are when we lay down our big bets. And I'll tell you, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the stock market tends to generally go up uh, and it is a, a foolish game to try to time that because the years in which the stock market did not do well, those four years that were down, those four out of 28 presidential election years where the market wasn't up, that was due to economic, not political uh, factors. So there were crises happening. Uh, three of those four years were 1932. I mentioned the Great Depression. That was happening. Uh, 2000, do you remember the tech stock bust? The dot-com um, bubble? The dot-com bubble. Mark Cuban got all his money. Yeah. And history will tell us someday if that was good or bad for the Mavericks. But, um, and then the, the third one the, was 2008. So that was the, the housing crisis. Um, so it's economic and not political as much as each side wants to convince you. If you vote for me, the market's going to do great. That tends to not be true. The market tends to do its thing and respond to economic indicators, not political indicators. It seems as though no matter who wins in a, an election year, optimism is the result. Because the markets kind of go like, okay, let's get after it. Let's start, let's start making something happen. That's kind of, that's kind of interesting psychological thing, but, um, it just tells me that if you're one of these fear mongers, we have done plenty of episodes on fear. Oh, sit on your money. I don't know what's happening out there. You'd be better served to be a faith monger and to go, I, I believe that, uh, good things are ahead and I'm just going to faithfully invest. I'm going to cast my bread up on the waters. I'm just trusting 
historically, that'd be a really wise move to do this year. Yes. Deploy, deploy your long-term money. Now, every time we've talked about investing um, in the stock market specifically, the stock market tends to be a very safe long-term investment and a very foolish short-term investment. So if you're saving for a down payment on a new house that you plan to buy in March of next year, please don't go put all that money in the stock market because we might have a down period and that would make you sad when you could just put it in a high-yield savings account and earn your 5% and buy your house. Um, but we've also talked recently about what happens when you take money that you need to spend in 30 years to pay your grocery bill when you're not working anymore and you stick it in your high yield savings account. And the answer is you don't have enough money uh, or you have a whole lot less than you could even if you have plenty. So investing for the long term and not trying to time things is the answer, but um, I, I kind of said, okay, politics is not the driver. The economy is. Uh, how's the economy doing? I listened to some some Democrats talk and some Republicans talk as they're campaigning right now. And both sides are going, we are the ones who are going to fix this struggling economy. And I, I talked about inflation being a concern for most Americans. I think the reason that most Americans are feeling that so acutely is because they still are looking at a grocery bill that is way higher than it used to be. I saw a kid on TikTok that somebody posted on Twitter that he had ordered his month of groceries on one of those delivery services. And a year later, or 18 months later, he logged in and saw that he could just push one button and reorder all the same stuff. And the bill had gone up by something like 250% for the exact same items. That feeling that everything is really expensive, I totally understand. However, what is the truth of what the economy writ large is actually doing right now? And I just want to give you some indicators for how the economy is doing. Um, All right. Here's some stats we use to measure overall health of the economy. One is economic growth. This is just how much is the GDP increasing year over year? And right now, we're at the low end of normal. We've, we've kind of grown 1.4%. Um, that's not huge growth. We don't actually want crazy fast economic growth, nor do we want contraction. That would be a recession. Um, so we're kind of at normal range right now, though. We're in the zone. Um, consumer sentiment is the same thing. They survey Americans and go, what do you think? How do you feel about the economy? As much as politicians are telling you, Everybody's so worried about the economy. Consumer sentiment right now is also in that average range. Um, it was really high a few months ago. Right now, it's kind of in the normal zone. Um, volatility, just meaning how much are uh, markets going up and down um, below average, which is actually a good thing. We don't want, you know, you talk about Bitcoin. It's very hard to invest in things that go up and down by 20% every week. We want things that are relatively stable. We can kind of depend on, on them in the market. Um, unemployment, very low right now, very bottom of the normal range. Um, treasury yields right in the middle of the range. So um, basically all of these things are pointing to we're not in a boomtown economy, but we're also, when you hear kind of naysayers or doomsdayers, we're actually not in a really bad economy. We're in a pretty healthy economy at the moment. Doesn't mean that we're going to stay there. I, in fact, I can tell you we will be in boomtown and we will be in a down economy. Both of those things will almost certainly happen in the coming 10 years. Um, we just don't know exactly when that's going to happen. Um, but my admonition to you is focus a little less on how does the, the politics impact the, the market right now? And a little more on what about the policies that these people introduce? And the good news of, or the bad news, depending on what you're invested in and how it's going, is that policies absolutely impact markets. And it takes generally some time for those policies to, to shake out through uh, markets. So if you're talking about well, I would like to see the stock market go up. Well, things that could cause that to happen is interest rates could go down and now money is cheaper for companies to borrow and they can grow faster. 
However, when interest rates go down too much, then that affects like how much money the individuals can borrow. And people can go out and do stupid things like borrow a bunch of money from their house and use it to buy cars, use it to buy more houses and jack up the price of housing and buy rental homes and now charge a whole bunch in rent. And all of a sudden, uh oh, we're back in that inflation problem. So my stock market went up, but my cost of living went up even more. And I didn't necessarily win in that trade. Um, you know, one of the big, big policy things that you'll hear people talk a lot about is. Uh, tax and the national debt. And there is a real difference in how the Republican Party and the Democrat Party um, approach taxation. You know, the Republicans tend to, generally speaking, be more of the let's lower taxes so that we can spur growth and expand the tax base and then we'll get more money. That happened under the first Donald Trump presidency. They lowered taxes a lot. Um, and they brought in more revenue than they were bringing in before. Sounds like a win, right? The problem is, on the other side of that, the Trump presidency, number one, departed from historical kind of Ronald Reagan days, which was let's cut spending. And they, they spent a whole lot of money. So mm. as much as they brought in more revenue, they also amped up the debt service cost to the country. So debt is a problem. And the way that you address it is you bring in revenue. And that is called taxation. So there is there is a real difference in taxation. Before I dive into that, I would like to to pause and just see. Do you have thoughts on this, Steve? Like, it, it, are you shocked to hear me say that the economy is actually doing OK or that um, there's there's policy issues on the table and they're different between the parties? Yes, you know, most of life is run based on emotions. We make most of our decisions based on emotions. We think of ourselves as being very rational, but we're not. And the feeling that the economy is just tumbling and crashing could be based on nothing more than um, we heard one story of somebody that's having trouble finding a job, and we noticed that the cost of milk keeps going up by 10 cents every three months. And so we think, well, the economy is crashing. So I am uh, a little surprised to hear you say we're on the low end of normal. Uh, and to be honest, because it's like an actual figure, it's a data point that's uh, concrete. It kind of uh, settles me a little bit. It makes me feel a little bit calm um, because it's easy to go into either extreme that the sky is falling or to think if we could get the right guy in the white house, everything would just be rosy. And neither of those is true. So I, I feel tempered by your, by your report. That's cool because I was sitting here while you were saying that thinking, you know, we've talked a little bit about how um, we're trying to, to increase the, the income to Abraham's wallet so that we can continue doing cool stuff. Uh, expanding this ministry. And I'm thinking uh, opportunity here is Mark Reed's calming economic statistics. Sure. As like a little album that people, when they start to get a little panicky and they listen to too much CNN or whatever, they can turn on Mark Reed's calming economic statistics. And I'll say consumer sentiment is 2% below average right now. It, it's pretty much average. Everybody feels fine. And, or we could uh, just we could just publish a bonus episode, and it's you just reading economic statistics. Period, whatever they are, and you could put those on if you ever having trouble taking a nap. Yeah, yeah, totally a good idea. Now I, I have to you you just hit on something that we have not described to the people. So are you going to put any legs to saying that we're trying to increase the the income of Abe's wallet because you threw that out and people don't know what you're talking about? Um, I I don't know if we have time today. So well, you you just threw it out there. Okay. Well, we're trying to increase the income to Abe's wallet. Um, this is more of your territory as the executive director of our little nonprofit, and the the board has has asked us to uh, mention it on the podcast. So you wanna you wanna take a quick? Sure. I'll just say uh quickly. I shared this with our kind of insiders. Um at ER, our online community. 
And that is that we just simply want to be transparent about our finances. I don't want this to sound at all like we're not outrageously uh, grateful for every single donor. If you give us $5 a month, we are grateful for that. It helps us. But I also want to be transparent with people and say, we presently operate at a deficit uh, to the tune of about $20,000 a year. Um, and we simply want to get into the black. So we had some people say, we don't know what your needs are if you don't tell us. So uh, my reaction to that, my ask for, for listeners is, uh, if you have friends who um, you've never told about Abe's Wallet before, or you think they would benefit from some of our content or some of the services that we offer people, whether it's coaching or conversations or anything, uh, would you please, would you please do that? Would you please connect us to them? And um, if they're the kind of people that care about the kingdom building families and them being wise financially and honoring God with their finances and the way they run their homes, and you think this would be a good place for them, would you please connect the dots with us and them? That's it. Now we can move on. Okay. I think that there, there are some moderators to what I said about the economy going strong. I'll just mention those quickly. You'll hear these as the election stuff ramps up. Social security. Have you heard of people? I'm worried about social security. Well, you're right to be worried about social security, Marge. It's scheduled to be empty by 2035. That sounds soon to me. When they set this thing up, uh, you typically lived like two or three years after you started receiving it. And now you typically live like 15 after you start receiving it. Um, so they either reform it and say, N like we've done before, the uh, retirement age is going to bump back or you increase taxes a lot or you deal with the consequences of just having it go busto, which seem pretty disastrous. So that's something to be aware of. I don't want the, I don't want Social Security going belly up before I get a taste of everything that I've put aside personally. Yeah, no joke. Um, you know, I, I'm more of a fan of the, the old Bush proposal to give you a this is my account and I've saved it, but that has yeah. never been a winner politically. Um, house prices have increased. Did you know that? So I did. If you just bought on average a house for a hundred grand in Ohio 40 years ago and you didn't do jack to it, it's only the innate appreciation of the house. It's worth $378,000 now. That's the same dingy house that was built in you know 1984 absolutely shocking same house in utah you could buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars in utah 40 years ago um the same house in utah today seven hundred and five thousand dollars oh my stars i will tell you ohio is in the bottom five for appreciation so that 100 to 378 is in the bottom five states Many states are in the seven to eight hundred percent increase uh, over that time. So, well, that's housing, no problem because incomes have come up by eight eight times too. Also, right? They have not. No. Um, so these are real problems. Policy solutions will will impact them. Um, I think we could go into a ton of stuff uh, on those. I'm going to go and spend the last few minutes that we have talking about one policy issue that I want you to be aware of. Do I'm it. just going to cover it briefly. I think we need to go get get our uh, our favorite certified public accountant, Jed, uh, to come back once we get some clarity on actually what's going to happen on this issue. Because spoiler alert, I'm about to talk about taxes. Um, so we'll bring him back to talk a little more in depth to your questions on this once it becomes clear where we're headed. Um, but I, before I go into that last bit, I just want to reiterate my main point for this episode, which is that there's a lot of noise. A lot of people are real worried. How is this election going to impact my money? And the answer is, historically, election years, despite all the, the noise, are less volatile in the stock market, which means you should not do anything that you wouldn't otherwise be doing in kind of in your long-term investing plan, which means I'm putting money in the stock market for the long haul. I'm not putting money there for the short term. I'm not placing bets and hoping things will double or whatever. Um, that's my, my long-term 
don't don't be reactive to the news bucket of money um and anybody that's telling you otherwise is probably preying on either fear they want you to click their links they want you to you know get out of the market and buy their life insurance policies or whatever it is so uh the the clear data through all manner of chaos that our country's been through for the last hundred years suggests that staying the course and being kind of steady handed through periods of time like this, especially in election years is, is the winning strategy. So do we have it there? Yeah. Okay. Now I just want to put this on your radar because the last Trump presidency, he introduced something that really impacted a lot of the families listening to this. It was called the tax cuts and jobs act. It happened in 2017. And I don't know if you remember when this happened, but it did some really big things like it doubled the standard deduction. So if you are a family, let's say you're just a married couple, no kids, and you got a standard deduction in today's dollars of 13,000 and change, you got twice that now. Uh, you don't have to donate any money. You don't have to deduct any mortgage interest, just your standard deduction, you get twice what you used to get. Overnight that happened. At the same time, they put a $10,000 cap on deductible state and local taxes. So if you're living large in San Francisco and you have a $4 million, what are those those houses called the, in San Francisco? Like the ladies or something? Anyways. Oh, the pink ladies? The pink ladies, yeah. The ones yeah, yeah. that are in the intro scene for hit 90s sitcom Full House. Um, if you owned one of those. You, you've got a $60,000 a year tax bill. Well, you can only deduct 10000 of that now. So that's not great. There were personal exemptions. We all, if we have kids, remember this. It's like, oh, I've got four kids. I get to take four exemptions when I file my taxes. And they're each worth five grand plus. Uh, those went away. And so now it's like, oh, we just get our big standard deduction. But the way the math shakes out, if you've got less than three kids, your new bigger standard deduction actually is less good than uh, the old standard deduction plus some personal exemptions for the kids. So large families took a hit. And then there was some, some big changes to the way that pass-through business income was treated. So if you're a business owner, um, that, that there was some new deductions introduced that kind of lines up with what we said that the, the philosophy was if we lower taxes on the people generating revenue, they'll do more of it and and will bring in more money. That, when it was created, was scheduled to go away in 2026. And that is still the case. So we don't know what's going to happen. All we know is that if nothing happens, all those changes revert to the way they were in 2026. And whoever wins the presidency is going to likely be able to control what happens to this particular law. And it will have a big impact on most everybody listening to this. Some people, it's going to help them out a lot. Some people, it's going to hurt them. Um, and anything could happen from they just go, yeah, let it expire, go back to the old system, to completely extend it all and keep the new system, to extend some of it and let some of it die. Um, those are all on the table. But this is where, you know, when I sent that email to our clients, I said, if you're paying somebody to manage your investments, and they're not looking at things like this and going, okay, we need to look over the next three years and say, are there any big windfalls coming? Would it, would it behoove you based on what we think is going to happen in the tax law to recognize more income now or to delay that income if we have the ability to control it? Um, those are the types of things that whether it's your CPA or your financial advisor, um, People on your team should be proactively thinking about that because this is an area where whoever wins the election is going to have a big impact on how you should manage your financial life. If we take the example of a married couple earning $200,000 and this whole thing, you know, right now they pay about $27,000, 27 dollars $27 to $28,000 in, in federal income tax on that two hundred, dollars And I'm just assuming they're not big givers. They're not itemizing. They're, they're just taking the standard deduction. No kids. Um, if this thing expires, suddenly they're paying $35,500. So they're paying a whole lot more in taxes. Um, 
I kind of like the fact that if we went back to the old system, people with large families get rewarded. I, personally, I think the government should should go that route. Hungary, I, I really like their move. They were seeing population decline and they said, okay, if you have four kids, no more income tax forever. I, I think that's pretty Genius. awesome. Genius, I love it. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to bring it up. And like I said, I've got two pages of notes on how this impacts the average family. I'm not going to go through that because I think it would be it would be speculation and really we don't know what's going to happen. But it's the type of thing where, as much as I said, politics don't matter to the stock market per se. Uh, policies certainly do matter to how you manage your money. And you need to either personally be on top of how those changes are, are going to impact you. Or, you know, in the case I just mentioned, you could end up paying 30% more taxes just because you weren't paying attention. Um, and whoever wins this election will have uh, impact on, on your money in that way. Just not that it's going to be like, oh, I'm going to see the stock market swing up or plummet based on my candidate winning or losing. That's, that's very unlikely to happen. Can I summarize some of what you've been saying? I would like you to summarize what I've been saying. I feel like okay. I've thrown a bunch of spaghetti at the wall. Let's see what's stuck. So what, what I hear is if you're the kind of person who likes to fast forward 55 minutes and see what they say at the end, what I hear you saying is do not, absolutely do not pull back your investment dollars because you're afraid of what's all the big turmoil that's going to happen in November. If anything, all that cash that you've been sitting on, you think, well, when things stabilize, I'll get into the market. Do that. Do that now. Do your, do your faithful investing now. Don't be worried uh, wringing your hands over well, the, the big election and then it'll tell me what to do. Don't do that. Just, just faithfully invest. And secondly, you're saying now the thing to watch out for is tax planning. So what, what I also heard there was the average American family doesn't think they need a tax strategist. They don't think they need tax planning. They're like, you just fill out the form and do what it tells you to. But there can be massive benefits for having a tax plan. And uh, if you have any professional that's helping hold your hand when it comes to your money, start to consider the implications of this, of, of this tax change that's going to be coming. I mean, there's gonna, something's going to happen. They're either going to renew it or they're going to shut it down or whatever. But there is a change coming, and you should be aware of that when it comes to your plan going forward. That's what I hear. I think you've summarized it well, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. I've crystallized your thoughts. Well, thank you for your tempering instruction for us today, Mark, that when, when the media around us and the culture at large is starting to foam at the mouth with political season, it happens every four years, we're always told this is the most important election of our lifetime. We always hear that every four years. And it would be wise for the people of God to not get bent out of shape, to not get pulled off sides by the culture. And certainly when it comes to your investing, please don't think uh, I I'm going to wait and do something dramatic based on what it feels like is the political temperature in a on any given day. Don't do that. Be faithful in the way that you invest, keep your head calm and do the work of God, leading your family, running your home and your dough like a biblical boss.